So listen, let me, let me say this to you. If you can have a righteous anger about all the sin going on in the world, and you have more anger about the, right, the sin that's going on in the world, but you're not angry about the own sin in your life, you've missed it, you have a problem. It is absolutely our job to call out sin. It is absolutely our job to call out injustice when we see it. But if you don't do it in your own life, you have missed it. And this is what it said. This is Jesus talking, and this is what it said. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers, and I am certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. And then Jesus said, I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humble, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Let's pray real quick. Father, Lord, we thank you for who you are. You are an amazing God. And tonight, Lord, we acknowledge that your presence is in this room. And that's what matters, God. So speak to us. Speak to our hearts. Say what you want to say tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So I used to be the worship leader here, and I, and I, I really enjoyed it. I had a great time singing on stage, and, and, and I had a great time leading people in worship. It's one of my passions. It probably always will be one of my passions. And, and so one day, I, you know, I was up here, and and I was singing away, and I was like, how great is our God? And I'm just giving it all I got, you know? And, and we wear in-ears, just so you know. And in the in-ears, we hear the... <laughs> which is uh, the metronome, all keeps us on time. We also hear some guide telling us, hey, sing here, don't sing here. And then there's also a microphone on stage. Tonight it was back in the drums where somebody can tell us, hey, you guys are off. You're missing that note, and they can get us back on again and, and keep the whole train from falling off the tracks if need be. And then there's another microphone back at the sound booth. And if anything really important needs to be said, it comes from there like, hey, pastor's not going to make it out on time. The tithes and offerings guy didn't show up. You guys need to extend. That kind of stuff would come uh, from back there. And, and one day I'm up here singing, and I hear, and, and Isaac was our sound guy at the time, and, and, and he, he decided, he said, Craig, if you can hear me. And I was like, what? I, I, I can't hear a word you say because I'm obviously singing. I'm leading the song. You know, it, it's going, you know, things are going well. You know, it's hyped. And I hear again, Craig, if you can hear me. And I was like, oh my, I, I don't know what you're saying to me. And then finally, he comes back on, he says, Craig, if you can hear me, your fly is down. <laughs> You're like, how great is our God, sing with me, please close the gate, dear God. You know, it's bad time, you know, because what he's, I'm leading the song, so literally I turned around, <laughs> zipped up my fly, and, 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 and went back. Back into leading worship, you know? It's, it's just one of those times, you know, you think everything's going great and you're like shouting down praise. This guy was like, I thought in the second row, he's going like this. I thought he's saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But he's probably saying, no, your fly's down, you idiot. You know, so. You know, guys, you ever have that problem? You're walking around, talk to people. You've been walking around all confident. Hey, how you doing? And all of a sudden, <laughs> <laughs> Somebody says, hey, bro, your fly's down. And you're like, oh, my gosh, how long have I been walking around like that? You know, because you're walking around all confident, like, hey, I'm doing good. And then somebody's like, dude, your fly is down. And it's like, oh, man, it's, it's, it's the worst, right? It's the worst. And, and you know, how, and maybe that hadn't happened to you, the fly thing. But how many of you have had bad breath before? 
Okay, if you didn't raise your hand, your neighbor needs to hand you a stick of gum because you probably have bad breath right now and you don't realize it. But you know, you have, you know, every once in a while you get bad breath. It happens to every single one of us. I remember when I would sing, I would come down off stage. When you sing, your mouth dries out a lot and so saliva doesn't move so you get a little bit of the halitosis. So I came and I would sit down with my wife and she'd reach over and she'd be like, you did so good. And I'd be, oh, thank you so much. And then she'd immediately be like, oh, here's the gum. Like, you know, and you have bad breath and it can make you feel confident, but then all of a sudden when that happens, you don't feel so confident. And kids, man, kids are so honest, you know? <laughs> One time I go to lay down with my son and I'm just cuddling with my son. He's young at the time. And I'm like, I love you, Jackson. And he's like, daddy. And I'm like, yeah, your breath is stinky. <laughs> I'm like, oh, man. All right. Daddy will go brush his teeth. Um, but you know, you have these things and you're walking around thinking, man, everything is good. Everything is great. And then you find out, hey dude, your fly's down. And you had no way of knowing. You know, sometimes you can have bad breath and you don't really know, you can't really smell it yourself. And you're walking around talking to people and somebody's like, oh my God, that guy, he's got bad breath. And tonight I wanna talk to you about self-righteousness. And self-righteousness is a, lot, is a lot like walking around with your fly down or walking around with bad breath because it's real easy for somebody else to spot on you but really hard for you to notice yourself. And you can be really confident about everything going on in life and then, and then you come to the reality of self-righteousness won't get you very far. And tonight, that's exactly what we're talking about, what Jesus was talking about with this passage when he tells this parable, he's talking about it. And I think for a lot of us, a lot of times we've heard this passage before, especially if you've been in church for a while. And we read this passage and we see that Jesus says, a Pharisee. And for us, when we see Pharisee, we think of the villain of the story. We think of the bad guys. We think of the guys who crucified Jesus, who, who Jesus said, you're nothing but a bunch of vipers. And, and, he, and Jesus was always rebuking the Pharisees. But that's not the reality of who the Pharisees were. You see, the Pharisees were actually the people who you probably desired to be like most back in the day. Because these were the people who took God's word very seriously. These were the people who actually did what God's word said to do. Everybody else kind of followed it. Maybe they didn't know it as well. But the Pharisees were very strict and they actually studied and they actually learned and they actually lived according to the word of God. And so people back then didn't look at them like oh, Pharisees and we take it as such a negative term these days. But it wasn't a negative term. It was really a much more positive thing. And people thought, man, I, I want to invite that guy. I want to be like that guy. And so when Jesus says a Pharisee did this, and when he tells it, it's very shocking for people. But you and I, I don't think it's as shocking for you and I because we already know who the Pharisees were and that they got it wrong. And so sometimes we sit here and we begin to think, well, I'm not the Pharisee, so good for me. And maybe we even identify with the tax collector. We've done some bad things in our life. And so all of a sudden, we start seeing ourselves as the one who went home justified before God. The only problem is, and I saw this quote the other day, and I thought it was a great quote. And it said this, I'm, but, <laughs> sorry, it said this. It said, the fastest way to become a Pharisee is to hate Pharisees. The fastest way to become a Pharisee is to call it out. The fastest way to become the thing you're not is to say, I'm not like that. See, a lot of us think, we're not the Pharisee. That's not me. That's not who I am. I'm not judgmental. I don't look at these people like that. I'm not like the Pharisee. And when you say that, you become just like the Pharisee. You are the one saying, oh, thank God, I'm not like so and so. And so you become just like the Pharisee. And see, sometimes that allows us to skip over this passage so quickly. So, well, I'm not a Pharisee. I'm not that type of person. And so we think the Pharisees were all bad people.
people, but that is not who they were. And here's the thing, you can't think, don't think it's not me. Anyone can become a Pharisee. And when I say that, I don't even mean that, that I don't even mean to put the word down for Pharisee. It could be any word you want to put in there. Jesus could have made it the tax collector, but anybody who looked at themselves and realized maybe they had done something in and of themselves to stand there and be justified before God. You see, we do this a lot, you and I. We, we, we justify ourselves a lot. We think, well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so, or I don't really do that or do this. And see, here's the thing. One of the most important things about the Pharisee and where we can go wrong and end up right there with him is the Pharisee forgot who he was talking to. See, he came in to pray to God and he stood off to himself and he forgot who he was talking to. See, a lot of us, when we go and pray before God, we forget who we are talking to. You see, we say, thank God. God, you need to help me with my job. God, you need to help me with my work. And we forget that God knows all of our secrets, all the things we've done that we don't want anybody to find out about. You see, this Pharisee walked in, thank God I'm not, this, I'm not like the tax collector. I'm not like this sinner. And the thing is, is God knew the sin that the Pharisee committed that very morning that he had overlooked and justified himself. And the mistake so many of us make is when we go to God, we forget who we are talking to. Our prayer life becomes, and it rarely ever contains, personal confession. We don't go before God and say, God, man, listen, I blew it in this area. I messed up in this. And we confess. Instead, we leave that part out. And we go back to God and say, God, I need you to help me with my job. I need you to help me with my work. God, I need you to, to fix my husband, God. God, I need you to fix my wife. She's crazy. And so we end up praying things like that. Or God, help me in this situation I'm in at work. And we forget who we're going to and who we're talking to. The sin of the Pharisee was self-righteousness, not devotion. And, and so we forget who we're talking to. And we go before God and we bring our problems and our misfortunes and things we're upset about and we bring all that to him. But how often do you go before God broken by your own sin? Broken by your own sin. Sometimes I think, we, we can, still we compare ourselves, right? And maybe sometimes we compare ourselves to ourselves. And we think, man, listen, I've kicked a few habits. I've stopped doing some of the things I used to do. And so you end up going to God and you end up saying, man, God, and you forget that the only reason you were able to kick those habits, the only reason you were able to make progress was because of Christ in you and what he could do inside of you. And you begin to think things like, well, it's my discipline. I've been working hard. And that's great. You do have to work hard and you do need discipline, but motivated by Jesus Christ himself inside of you. Because if discipline could save you, then you wouldn't need Jesus. See, you can work hard and you can make progress and that is good and you should be proud of what Christ has done in you. Boast in Christ. But don't ever forget who you're talking to. Don't forget who brought you there. Don't forget who got you there. And don't forget that he is the only one who can get you there. Yeah. See, it's not the Pharisee that was the problem. It's the idea that we or he or we can, can become something in and of ourselves and be good and justified before God. So listen, let me, let me say this to you. If you can have a righteous anger about all the sin going on in the world and you have more anger about the, right, the sin that's going on in the world, but you're not angry about the own sin in your life, you've missed it, you have a problem. Yeah. 
It is absolutely our job to call out sin. It is absolutely our job to call out injustice when we see it. But if you don't do it in your own life, you have missed it. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about when he's like, you'd want to take the speck out of your brother's eye, but you miss the log that is in your own eye. It's so easy to get angry and upset about what's going on in the world. And you be upset about that and think, listen, I'm on the right side. So I'm good. And you can use that because you're on the right side. It's good. And you can forget that, yes, those things are an abomination before God. But your lying tongue and your gossiping tongue are just as much of an abomination before God as those things you spend all your time calling out in the rest of the world. Don't, don't get confused here. You absolutely should call out things that are wrong in the world. Because if you don't speak up, who will? So you have to do that. But you have to take just as much zeal and just as much vigor and put it and attach it in your own life and examine your own life and say, listen, God, I am a sinner steel and I cannot make it a day without you. And what I would hate, this is why it's easy to become a Pharisee. Because what happens is, is you begin to say, I'm on the right thing. I'm on the right side. And you know what? I go to church. I pay my tithe. And you get distracted. And you think all of those things are what's going to get you to heaven. And they aren't going to get you anywhere. Didn't you hear? The Pharisee tithed. The Pharisee did exactly what he was supposed to do. That's what I want you to see. He was the good person. He was on the right side. Everything was exactly right. The tax collector was not on the right side. Tax collectors were horrible people. They basically had sold out to the Romans. They were selling their own people out. They were stealing from their own people. They were horrible individuals. They were, in fact, bad people. But which one went home justified before God? The one who threw himself on the mercy of Jesus Christ, who threw himself on the mercy of God. That's the one who went home justified. So many times we, we compare ourselves to other people and we think, listen, I'm a good person. I mean, you heard Pastor Daniel talk about it on Sunday. Most people don't think they're gonna go to hell. Most people think they're, good enough to make heaven, if there is a heaven. But that's not true. There's only one way to go to heaven, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. That is the scandal, that is the audacity of the gospel. This is why the gospel can be offensive and offend people. Because you can work your entire life to be good and check all your boxes and do all the right things and, and, and make it to heaven. And then somebody who's been a horrible person their entire life can throw themselves at the mercy of Jesus Christ and they'll make it to heaven as well. No other religion is like that, by the way. All other religions, you have to work, 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 and you can get there. So, so let me say this. Be careful that you don't become a Pharisee because what you think when you think, well, I've done this, well, I've done that, well, I've done this, what you begin to think is you've done it instead of God. So does that mean that we shouldn't work hard? No, we should work hard. Yes, we should be disciplined. That's a given. But we should be be thoughtful of where that comes from, that it comes from Jesus Christ. You or I, we cannot do anything in and of ourselves. There is none good. See, when we do good things, we begin to fool ourselves into thinking, well, I'm a good person. The Bible straight up says there are none who are good. Listen, Isaiah 64, 6 says this, we are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall and our sins sweep us away like the wind. 
Listen, sin makes us unclean. You and I, we are sinful, and we don't want to admit that we're sinful. That's what self-righteousness does. We want to prove that we're good. Adam did it right from the beginning, right? He said, God says, hey, did you eat of this tree? Well, actually, I ate the fruit that the woman that you gave me. <laughs> Not my fault, God. I'm a good person. And so many of us live in that same world. And we, we get mad. We get mad in the, when things don't go the way we want them to. And we think, well, God, I'm a good person. I've done everything you asked. God, how can this happen to me? That's what Job was basically saying to God. He was saying, you know what, God? How does this happen to me? I've done everything you've said. You're not a just God if this is the way this works. And what does God? God comes down and says, hey, wait a second. Who do you think you are? I am the God who created this universe. Were you there during any of this time? And Job says, whoa, wait a second. I'm so sorry that I said that. And he says, thank you, because now I just knew of you, but now I have a firsthand knowledge of who you are. And here's something I want, to, want you to see that's outside of that. Sometimes you go through things in life. Sometimes God allows things to happen to you so you can have firsthand knowledge of who he is. Sometimes we, we, we don't know why we go through situations. And let me ask you this question, and it, it may be a challenging question, but is there anything, is there anything that God would not take away from you to get you to value your soul as much as he values your soul? The Bible says it's better for you to cut your hand off and just part of your body go into heaven than all of your body be thrown to hell. Is there anything that God would not? And I'm not telling you God does bad things to you, but he values your soul above anything else in your life. Because your soul is eternal. Everything in this world is temporary. Even the troubles and trials you go through, they are temporary. And so he wants you to understand and have firsthand knowledge of who he is, that he is a good God. Romans 3, 9 through 20 says this. Well, then, should we conclude that we Jews are better than others? No, not at all, for we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. As scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. Sometimes I think we, as Christians, we, we tend to put ourselves up here and think, well, look at all the good things we do. and We put other people down here. But there is, no, there is no difference. We are all sinners. And only some of us has rec have recognized the need for a savior. That's the only difference. My sin, all of our sin is the same. So I want you to know this. Uh, you can't love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and body and love your neighbor as yourself, as yourself if you don't take an honest look of your own life and understand we're all sinners. And when you start grasping that, then you can start loving your neighbor as yourself. Because you stop comparing them to either yourself or whatever. Because when you understand that we're all walking around measuring people by whatever standard, the standard is Jesus Christ and he was perfection incarnate. You cannot measure up. You cannot measure up. You cannot Measure up to Jesus. So Romans 9, 30 through 31 says this. What does all this mean? Even though the Gentiles were not trying to follow God's standards, they were made right with God. And it was by faith that this took place. But the people of Israel who tried so hard to get right with God by keeping the law never succeeded. It is by faith and faith alone. How do you please God? By faith. That's how we are justified before God. So tonight, I, I don't want you to ever think, man, I, I, it'll never be me. I'll never be the Pharisee. 
because it's incredibly easy to fall into this trap. Just as easy as it is to walk around with your fly down. To fall into this trap of, of well, I'm not like them. Thank God I'm not like them. It's funny because it's, 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 it's so easy to get caught in this. And so tonight, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm not telling you to be self-deprecating. You're like, oh, I can't do anything. Because you know what? Some of you have made great progress. God has done amazing things in your life. And you should boast in Jesus Christ and what he has done in your life. Sometimes, sometimes you're going to go and you're going to make the exact same mistake again. And you're going to blow it all over again. And you're going to feel shame and guilt, but there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And you're going to feel so, you're going to blow it again and again. Listen, the, sometimes we look at at the Old Testament and we see it over and over and we see the sacrifices and all the things that happen and we think the Old Testament really represents the wrath of God. But really, let me make sure this is clear to you. The Old Testament, every time they took a sacrifice to the altar, that was a sermon on the mercy of God. Because that sacrifice atoned for their sins. We look at and we see, we see the Old Testament with so much. We think about it as wrath, as God was a judgmental God back then. It's not the case. Do you, do you, ever, do you ever hear the story of Hosea? God comes to Hosea and he's like, hey, go take a wife from whoredom. What? God, go take a wife from, I can't even say that word. That's a bad word, God, whoredom. Um, go take a wife that's a hooker and go have children from whoredom. You're not even going to know if those children are yours. And what happens, he goes, gets a wife. And she leaves him. She goes right back to her old life. And God says, go get her again. She does it again. And he goes, gets her again. And it happens again. And he goes, gets her again. And she keeps having children. And he has no idea if the kids are his. And what it is, it's a lesson in understand how God was treating Israel and how God will treat you and I. He will always come back for you no matter how many times you run from him, no matter how many times you go back to your old life, you can always come back to God. See, sometimes I've, I've done things I'm not proud of. The reality, this sermon is born out of the fact that the other night I was sitting there thinking, I am not always a good person. And I do not always do the right thing. I make bad choices. Sometimes I'm literally a bad person. You need to know that about me. Even though somebody may call me pastor, sometimes I don't do the right thing. And thank God I have Jesus. Because if it was about me doing the right thing all the time, I'd never make it. I would never make it. And sometimes the, the devil comes to me and he, he reminds me of my past. And he says, you know what? You, you did this thing. And you did it again. And you did it again and again and again. And you know what? I said, you know what, devil? You are right. But I am a new creation in Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So devil, get behind me right now. You gotta know you can boast in Christ. You may not have a great track record, but Jesus Christ does. You may not have always done the right thing, but Jesus Christ did. You may not always be a good person, but Jesus Christ is a good person. You can blow it and you can look and you. You have to be able to take a look at your life and examine your life. You have to be willing to confess your sin to God, to go to God and know exactly who it is you're talking to. He knows everything about you. There's nothing you hide from him. There's nothing you can you present to him that he doesn't already know about. What's the problem is so many of us want to think, okay, we did these good things and so those things don't really count. 
And so we justify them in our own mind. And then we never confess them and we never take them to God. And listen, you keep things hidden, you keep things in hide when you, inside. When you're not honest with yourself, it has room to grow. It has room to take you captive. Sin is real. It's like we don't talk, it's like sometimes we don't talk about sin enough. But sin is real and it plagues every single one of us. So how do you combat it? How do you come against it? Humility is the answer. Humility is the answer. He said it in verse, at the end of verse 14, he said this, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So here's what I wanna do. With every head bowed and every eye closed and nobody looking around, I'm gonna do two things tonight. And the first one is this. Maybe you don't know Jesus. You've never made him Lord of your life. Maybe you thought you weren't good enough. Maybe you thought, I'm not a good person. Maybe you thought, I, can't, I don't always do the right thing. Whatever you think. Let me tell you something. Jesus is standing there with open arms standing there with open arms waiting for you. And it doesn't matter what you've done, where you've come from, all the mistakes you've made, they're irrelevant because Jesus is the standard. And what he does is he gives you his righteousness, not your righteousness, which is a false righteousness. He gives you his righteousness. And so tonight, I want to give you an opportunity to make Jesus Lord of your life. So if you're here tonight and you say, Craig, I have never made Jesus Lord of my life. I have never made Jesus Lord of my life. Or if you're here and you say, man, I came to Jesus, but things happened, things got rough, I made some mistakes. You know what? I just thought better of it and I went my own way. But you're here tonight and let me tell you something. Jesus knew you were gonna be here. The Holy Spirit knew you were gonna be here and he's planned this service just for you. So listen, tonight, if you need to make Jesus Lord of your life or you need to come back to Jesus, you need to surrender to him once again. If that's you, I don't want to call you out. I don't want to embarrass you, but I want to know who you are so I can pray with you, so I know who I'm praying with. So if there's anyone here, you say, I need to make Jesus Lord of my life, if you would, raise your hand right now. Is there anybody here? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Anybody else? As I look across the bottom, thank you, thank you. So look across the bottom one last time. Anybody down here? I see you, those hands across the top. Thank you guys very much. Listen, I never want to belabor something, but I also don't want you to miss an opportunity. If you think you should raise your hand, that is the Holy Spirit impressing that upon your heart right now. And so one last time, is there anybody else? Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else? Listen, if you raised your hand, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. If you didn't, I want you to repeat this prayer in support of those who did. Would you say, Father, I come to you now. I surrender all that I am to you. And I thank you that you are perfect, that you are enough when I'm not enough. So Father, I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord, that he is the Savior. And I give all that I have to you. And I purpose to follow you for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Listen, you can give it up for those who raise your hand.